in John chapter 14, verse 6. Jesus said to him, I am the only way to God and the real truth and the real life. No one comes to the Father but through me.
yes, your name. Oh, yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Oh, yes, I Glorify, glorify the name of all 
Father, we just thank you so much for your word. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you that we can use his name in any situation that we have. Father, we thank you for that. Lord, I just thank you for tonight. I thank you for the service. I thank you for the anointed word that's coming to our ears. Father, I pray that we receive it in the name of Jesus, that we let it go deep into our heart and let it be used in our lives this week as as we go through our, our days. Father, I thank you for that. And we just thank you again for tonight, and we praise you for um, just allowing us to come together and worship you and give you glory, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Good evening, everyone. So glad that you're here, and hello on YouTube. Um, We're glad that you're tuning in, too. So um, if you're listening on YouTube, you know, give us a like, send us a comment. We'd love to hear from you. Um, So... As far as what's happening this week, uh, we have services every Saturday night at 5 p.m. here at 505 State Street, and then on Wednesdays at 7 p.m., and like I said, you would only not eat once a week, so come on Wednesdays and get fed. Um, And then we have um, children's ministries open on Wednesdays for the um, first through sixth grade, and then we also have children's pre-K on Wednesdays and on Saturday nights. Um, So if you have kids in those age groups, bring them on in. Um, We also, the Jesus Pieces Youth Group meets on Wednesdays at 7 p.m. So if you're a youth, if you have kids that are in that age, bring them to church. It's, like I said, it's a recipe for good success. Um, Get them in the Word of God. Um, October 22nd is the men's um, meeting at 7 p.m. And then Gathering in Deutimus, looking into November, that'll be November 26th. And we'll have more details on that as we get closer. And then um, we have prayer on Fridays at 10 a.m. And then at Saturdays at 8 a.m. So get ready to receive. I know God's got a good word for us. So just soak it in and uh, he'll have a good word for you. I know that. So right now, let's welcome Randy up for tonight's tithes and offering. But we're so blessed to be here. And like Karen was saying, uh, we're getting fed the Word of God, and what a blessing it is to be able to get fed the Word of God. Amen? Amen. It's such an such a honor and a privilege uh, to be able to grow our faith and, uh, and to fellowship with one another. It's a, it's a blessing. It's something I look forward to every week, and, and it's a real encouragement and uh, a blessing. I look forward to it because <clears throat> excuse me, good news is an island of love and compassion, and so praise God. So we can share our love with uh, one another. And so, praise God. My name is Randy Cepeda. Actually, I changed my name to Randy Sky High Cepeda. <laughs> and so, because I'm excited about God. I'm so high for Jesus. Amen. <laughs> so, uh, I'm, I'm <laughs> lost track here now. Uh, praise God. Uh, my name is Randy. And so, I'm receiving uh, today's offering, tithes, receiving today's tithes and offerings. And Amen. What a blessing it is. Praise God. That's what, that's what I love about being here is uh, you don't have to turn people upside down. I don't have to uh, convince everybody to give. Everyone comes ready and willing to give because of the love in their heart. Amen. Because they love other people. They love God and, and want to be a part of a good work. And so, and that's uh, what the scripture I'd like to use for the offering. It's uh, in Hebrews chapter 10. And uh, starting in verse 23, it says, Let us hold fast to the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that has promised. And so God is faithful that when we give, it's given back to us so that we can be an even greater blessing. Amen? And not that we can line our pockets and, uh, and try to get into heaven by our, by our riches like we are learning on Wednesday, but because, uh, because we care about other people. But it goes on to say in verse 24, And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works. So our giving is is provoking one another. It's doing a work that God has called us to do. And not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much as more as we see the day approaching. 
we see the day approaching that Jesus Christ is coming, the importance of Good News Church. Good News Church has a plan and a purpose as God is fulfilling right now and in the future to bring in the harvest of, of souls into the kingdom of God. So thank God for your love and your generosity of giving into the gospel. It's making a difference in people's lives. It's making a difference in our lives, and we're stirring each other up, amen, to do good works. And so praise God. Let me pray for your giving. Father, I come before your throne, and Father, I thank you for this opportunity of giving into the gospel. And Father, we just pray, Lord, Father, that you would use our giving, Lord, as an opportunity to encourage one another and, and be able to encourage other people online and, and people that are, are coming into the kingdom of God. And Father, we just thank you, Father, for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Why don't you stand up here, uh, Randy, stand off to the side here, will you please? Uh, Vern Wands, you're in the other room. Could you please come here? Uh, it's his birthday coming up on Monday. If you have a birthday this month, why don't you stand up because uh, Randy's going to pray for you. I want you to stand up. If you have a birthday this month, please stand up. And those of you at home, just put a hand on yourself. Uh, we love you. We, we care about you. It's Vernon's birthday this uh, Monday, and he's going to get a little older. And uh, come on up here, bud. We're, we're going to use you as some. We're not going to sing to you because uh, if it's singing, it would be me leading it or Randy, and you don't want that. But we can. why don't we just tell him happy birthday? Happy birthday. Just go lay your hand on him and pray for him, will you please? There you go. And uh, those of you at home, Randy's going to pray for, for uh, Vern here because his birthday is Monday. But also those of you here or those of you at home that may be your birthday this month, we want to let you know that you're special. You're special to God, that's for sure. You're special to the family of God. So we want to make sure we, we, we pray for you special. Go right ahead. Can I just say a little bit about him just real quick? Uh, yep. I just want to say everyone here is a blessing, and everyone is uh, a blessing to this church, but I just want to say, uh, give a special thanks. I'm so blessed to have this man around. He is such a blessing to this church, not just for today, but he's been a blessing for many, many years. My kids, they walk, they know, uh, anybody that they know in this church, it's Vern, and he's been a blessing to somebody, so many people, and so we are so blessed to have this man. Uh, in our lives. And so I just want to pray for him and for everybody else. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for Vern. What a godly example he is to us and what a blessing he is to this church and to, to the family. And Father, we just thank you, Lord, Father, for you continue to bless him abundantly above all that we can ask or imagine. And Father, I thank you that he, uh, you would use him in a more and more in a mighty and a powerful way. Use each and every one of us, Lord, Father, uh, to open up doors that, that are closed to bring people into the kingdom of God. And Father, we just thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And Karen, happy birthday to you. God bless you, young lady. I looked over and you're standing also. Uh, but she's a lot younger than Vern, doesn't you know, <laughs> We know that. God is good. Uh, my sister Patsy went in the other day to get some tests done at the hospital, and they kept her for a couple of days. So if you please just keep, keep her in prayer. Uh, we're believing things are fine. They're just running tests. But I told her I'd ask for the church to pray for her. Keep her in prayer. If you would, please, Patsy. Uh, you may refer to her as Pat. I refer to her as Patsy. I've always done that since I was little. And so she's kind of special to me and, uh, and to our family. And so keep, please keep her in prayer. Today I want to talk to you again about don't let the thief rob you. This is the third time we're talking about this. And it's not because I can't think of anything else to talk about because there's so much a pastor can talk about. You really seek God all week on what does God want you to talk about. And I knew early on that we were going to spend some time here. We have spent a little longer than I thought, but that's okay because God wants, I believe God is directing us to do that. Uh, don't let the thief rob you. We're talking about things that are important in your life and my life and a Christian's life that the enemy would like to take from you. And, and again, we want to lay a, a Bible a foundation on what we're talking about. Uh, God himself over in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8 says, Be sober and be vigilant uh, for your adversary, the devil, like a roaring lion walketh about seeking he whom he may devour. I want you to notice here, it tells us we must be sober and vigilant. We have to be aware of the fact that we have an enemy. Some people say, oh, you're talking about the devil. Uh, this is the Bible. The Bible's talking about the devil. He wants us to be aware of who our enemy is. So we find out that we need to be sober and vigilant, be aware of this, because we have an adversary. He's the devil, and he wants to devour you. Now, I like this part of it. 
whom he may devour. Why don't you just say he may not devour me? And with the information that we've been giving you and the information that you've already probably know from reading the Bible, uh, he, you don't have to allow him to devour you. You know, Jesus tells us a little bit more about this enemy that, that the Word of God is telling us about over in John 10.10. and uh, 10, 10, says, the thief cometh not. And he says he's a thief. He tells us the enemy is a thief. The devil is a thief. And, and that's important. We must know that first of all. Uh, usually when something is named first in the Bible, that means uh, that's the most important thing they're trying to get across to you. And he says, the, the, the thief cometh not but to steal, to kill, and destroy. He wants to steal from you because he's a thief. After he steals from you, then he wants to kill you, take your life, your vision, uh, your family from you. He wants to destroy everything about you. But his main thing is he wants to steal from you. So we've been talking about that and explaining that, that really you don't have to let him steal from you. Uh, over in James chapter 4 and verse 7, it kind of gives you an idea of, of what you need to do to not allow Satan to steal from you. It says, submit yourself unto God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So if you resist him, he has to go from you. He can't steal anything from you. You resist him and he has to go from you. Now the reason for that is because God is with you. Over in Matthew chapter 19 verse 26, it says it this way. Jesus said unto them, with man this is impossible. With God all things are possible. Uh, you have God with you. You have God on the inside of you. The Bible says greater is he that is in you than he's in the world. So with God all things are possible. I can't resist the devil. Yes you can. You can resist the thief. You, you don't have to le let him steal from you. You can tell him forget it. Get out of here. And, and now if you've already been robbed, we've also talked about this, and we'll be talking about that a little bit uh, again today. If you've been robbed, please know this, you can get it back. The things that we, are talked to, uh, that we have talked about, the things that we'll talk about today, if you look at them and hear them and you go, I, that's been robbed from me, that's been taken from me, know this, that you can get it back. If God with you can stop it, God can with you get it back. Amen? Because God is greater than our enemy. Now the last two weeks we've been talking about some things that are very important. I believe they are massively important. If I said, what don't you want the, the thief to rob you of? You might have come up with different things. But I want you to see that these are the word, this is the word of God and we're really getting into it. Uh, one of the things we talked about was unity. Why in the world would the thief want to steal your unity? Because the Bible, we went there and we found, we found out that God commands his blessings on unity. Why do you think, uh, you know, uh, the country is trying to be torn apart? Why do you think a, a business will be trying to be torn about? Why do you think a marriage will be trying to be torn about, or friendships, or families? You know, why? Why would that happen in a church? Why would the devil come in and try to tear and rob unity? Because the Bible says, because when there's unity there, God commands his blessings. Not just let it go. He commands it. And Satan doesn't want you to be blessed. He wants to bring division in any area of his life that he can. The second thing we talked about was joy, and we said that joy is important. Joy, the Bible tells us, the joy of the Lord is our strength. So if you're growing weak and you want to get strong, it says the joy of the Lord is your strength. And so being around God, being around Christian people, being in church, uh, he's trying to divide, he's trying to get you away from God, because then you'll start finding the joy of the Lord and you'll start finding your strength. strength. And, and Satan doesn't want you to be joyful, and Satan doesn't want you to have strength. Then we said the third thing was generosity. It's amazing to me that Satan wants to steal your generosity. See, generosity is when you bless others, you get rewarded, you bless others, they get blessed. He wants to steal generosity because if he steals our generosity, he stops us from being rewarded and he stops those who God is telling us to bless or an organization God is telling us to bless uh, they won't get blessed. So Satan wants to steal your generosity. He thinks if he can steal your generosity, he'll steal a reward that you'd be getting, and he'd steal the blessing that the person you're supposed to give to would be re receiving. He wants to hurt you. He wants to hurt the person. So he's trying to get you not to be generous. Now, as we've said before, it's interesting as you look at these things that those who are generous tend to be more joyful or tend to have more joy. And those who have joy tend to be more generous. And so as we see these, see these things, a Satan, the thief, wants to steal your joy, your generosity, your unity, because then you'll, you, uh, you'll be hurt, and you'll hurt others, or you'll, you'll end up hurting others. And you don't want to do that, do you? 
No, you don't want to do that. When we see people pull back, again, they pull back in these areas. Unity, you don't see them around. They pull back in joy. They're not as happy. If they're here, they're, they're kind of sad. Or generosity, they quit giving uh, to others, blessing others, praying for others, giving financially, and you see that. And so you start to see that. Then last week we talked about one, and we got uh, quite a few calls on this one. I didn't know I was getting all that excited when I talked about zeal, but it was real. Uh, we talked about don't let the, the thief rob you of your zeal. And, and, you know, we said zeal was a great energy and enthusiasm in the pursuit of a cause. Great energy or enthusiasm in pursuit of a cause. You know, Satan wants to steal your zeal. And we told you this last week. It's real. He wants to steal your zeal. See, he knows if he can steal your zeal that you'll back off. He knows if he can steal your zeal, you'll pull back. He knows if he can steal your zeal, you'll not accomplish the thing God wants you to accomplish in your life. He knows if he can steal your zeal, he can kill your momentum. He knows if he can steal your zeal, he will destroy your enthusiasm. Decide not to let him steal your zeal. It is really a decision. This week, uh, somebody has said some things to me, and I, I, I was starting to get a little down. I called Randy up. Actually, I, he didn't know it. And he just was all excited. He goes, man, I've got zeal. And I said, and, and I told my wife, talking to Randy, I got my zeal back. Sometimes we just need to keep our zeal so we can have other people have zeal. Amen? And by the way, I just want to let you know this. Our preachers will tell you a lot of times when they preach on something, they're, they're, they're uh, tested on that themselves. And so I guess I was tested on whether I was going to give up my zeal. I haven't given it up in Jesus' name. Amen? If, if it's been taken from you, again, we said last week, and listen, please. If your zeal has been taken from you, say, I don't know if it has. Well, ask the person around you. They can tell you. Uh, they'll let you know right away. Yeah, your zeal is not there. Or just ask the Lord, am I going to church as much? Am I praying as much? Am I excited about the things of God as much? Am I dedicating my time as much? Or am I begrudging every time I do something for God? Those are signs that you are starting to lose your zeal. Now, we looked on how to get it back. We looked over in Revelation chapter 2. And we looked at verses five, I mean four and five. Can you put that up there if you would, please? But I have this, uh, now he's talking about the church at Ephesus. This is Jesus Christ himself speaking to this church, and he's been telling them some good things they're doing. But then he says this. You can do a lot of good things, but then he says this. But I have this complaint against you. You don't love me or each other as you did at first. He says, when you first loved me, when you first came into the kingdom of God, man, you'd do anything. You'd cancel things. You'd do anything just to, because you love me so much. You really had zeal. Now read the next verse. In verse 5 it says, look how far you have fallen. Turn back to me and do the works you did at first. Now, I want you to hear this. How do I get my zeal back? Somebody says, I'm waiting for my zeal to get back, and then I'll do some stuff. No, he says, do the stuff, and the zeal comes back. Now, I'm waiting to get the zeal, and then I'll do something. No, no, he says, do the things you used to do, and then the zeal will come back. Say, I just don't have the zeal anymore. I just don't have that excitement anymore. I used to be excited about Good News Church. I used to be excited about the kingdom of God. I used to be excited about my family. I used to be excited about the work. I used to start doing the things you used to do, and then the zeal will come back. Not reversed. You're sitting around waiting for the zeal to come. It's kind of like giving. You give, and it's given back to you. You, you start Showing zeal, you start doing the things you used to do, and the zeal comes back. Jack, for real. Amen? Amen? Now, it doesn't just say it there. How do you get the zeal back? Start doing what you used to do. But also, it says it again. The Apostle Paul, who's a great man of faith, knows a lot about the walk of God. He says this. He's writing to his spiritual son, uh, Timothy. And in 2 Timothy chapter 1, and verse 6, uh, notice what he says here. He says, Wherefore I put thee in remembrance of that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of the hands of my hands. He's saying, I gave you some fire. I gave you some enthusiasm. I gave you some zeal when I laid my hands on you. There's a gift of God burning on the inside of you. Now, my my son went out and got a fire pit thing, you know, portable fire pit. And he puts it in our driveway, and he puts wood in there, and we light it. And we go out there, and we, we cook some uh, marshmallows, you know, we toast some marshmallows. We have a little good time. But it's amazing. Let me say this to you. Do you know the way he gets it started is he puts wood in there? And the way he keeps it uh, fire going is he puts more wood in. If you don't put wood in, guess what happens? The fire starts going less and less. So you need to put wood in there for the fire to come up. Amen. So that's how it started, 
by wood, and that's how it continues is by wood. So now watch what he says. Uh, it says, uh, this right here says, stir up the gift. Now that word stir up, another translation says it, uh, says it uh, keep it burning. And, and I just want to talk to you about why that's important. The, that word there is a three compound Greek word. I'm not good at Greek. I just know I can look things up. And they'll say, this is how you pronounce it. I'm terrible at pronouncing things. So I'm just going to tell you what it means. Three different parts. The first part of, of this here, this is what you need to do, is repeating earlier action. So even here, he says, I want you to repeat your early action. What you were doing before, start doing again. It kind of reminds you of what Jesus says in Revelation. Do what you did. And here, the same thing is being said in the Greek word. The first part of that Greek word says, start repeating your earlier action, Timothy, because you're starting to lose your fire. Uh, the way you would keep fire is Gregory, my son, would put wood in. And he's repeating the earlier action, and that would cause the fire. The second part of the, of the Greek word, uh, stir up, is this, enthusiastically. So you repeat the earlier actions, and do it enthusiastically because you know some good things are going to happen. And the last part of the Greek word means fire in Jesus' name. So if you and I repeat the earlier actions, we do it enthusiastically, and all of a sudden fire hits. Remember, you do it first, you do it with as much enthusiasm you have, and then all of a sudden fire comes up and leaps up on the inside of you. Amen? So how do you keep your zeal? Do what you did at the beginning. I, serious, don't wait for the fire to start. Start doing something and the fire will come. Start repeating the earlier action. Start putting some wood on the fire. Y amen? amen? Okay, now the one we're going to talk about today, so it's point one today, is uh, don't let uh, the thief rob you of a focus. And this is really important. Don't let the enemy or the thief steal your focus. He's good at that, and he wants to do that. I look, looked up a couple quotes of men of God, and one said this. He said, when things are out of focus, you don't see things correctly. You know, when, when your focus isn't right, you'll start seeing things incorrectly. You'll start disliking people. You'll not like situations because you're seeing them incorrectly. I was talking to somebody not too long ago, and they said the per this certain person they talked to has a, gives everyone a motive for everything. And uh, I used to hang around with people like that. They give you a mo They give everybody I met a motive. Do you know why they're doing it? Do you know what? Well, you know, if you're not careful, you're not really seeing it right. And so you have improper focus, and so you're seeing things incorrectly. And we have to be careful. When your focus isn't right, you'll see things incorrectly. Another quote from a man of God is this. When you're not focused, you could end up anywhere. When you're not focused, you can end up anywhere. If you and I got together and I, I put a, a blindfold on your eyes to take off, and I just told you to walk, and you started walking, you could end up anywhere at all. You wouldn't even know where you're going. You'd just be walking all around, especially if it was an open area, nothing you can touch. You wouldn't even know where you're going. So the truth is when you don't have uh, good focus, you could end up anywhere. Maybe not where God wants you. Maybe not doing what God wants you to do. Not in the place God has wanted you to be and doing the things God wants you to do. But your focus now has been taken off of God and off of the things of God. And now you're going to end up anywhere, anywhere at all. Now, here's some things about focus. Focus brings power into your life. Focus will bring power into your life. A shotgun is a powerful thing, but it scatters. It, it scatters. A, a rifle will go right to the core of the target. Uh, uh, when you are focused on something, uh, karate guys and people like that, they'll, they'll focus their, their fists and they'll focus their hands, and they'll bring all that focus on one spot, and that power is there. When you focus on something, focus will bring power into your life. Focus is when you're single-minded. When you're single-minded about something, you're not... Uh, dual-minded. You're not w wavering back and forth. You're single-minded. I'm doing this thing for God. I don't care what happens. As they used to say, don't be insulted, but they used to say, come hell or high water, we're do doing this because you are focused on the situation. Now, I think this. I think focus is a spiritual gift of God that's available to each and every one of us. I do believe that. I believe when we turn our back or walk away from God or start resisting God or pull back from God, we start losing focus. I really do believe that. But when you and I pull close to God or we're, we start put doing the things we used to do and we say, God, help me, I believe God starts helping us with a spiritual blessing of focus. Let me read to you on one of the reasons I think that is 2 Chronicles chapter 30 and verse 12. 
2 Chronicles chapter 30 and verse 12. It says, also the hand of God was on Judah to give them singleness of heart. Now, now look up here. Some of you may be looking at your Bibles. A lot of you look up here. Some look on their, iPhone, uh, uh, their, their, phone, their phone or iPad. Now watch. The hand of God was upon Judah to give them. He gave them singleness of heart. They were single-minded. They were focused on one thing. Singleness of heart. When you say to God, God, please give me a vision, what you want me to do in my life. Father, tell me the first step I'm supposed to take. We're in the middle as a church getting ready to do something. And I, I talked to a, a pastor friend of mine. I said, it really bothers me. I don't have the whole picture. All I know is the next step. And he said, well, isn't that what faith is? Well, yeah, sometimes faith is, or not sometimes, all the times faith is taking the step of faith and just reaching out. So right now, we have to take that step, but you have to be single. I'm going to do this in Jesus' name. Uh, God will give you that singleness of heart. Now, now uh, in Joshua, he even tells Joshua about single-mindedness or singleness of heart. Now watch this. He's telling Joshua. Joshua is taken over from Moses. Joshua now is in charge of three million Jews, and he's supposed to lead them now into the promised land. And God is giving him directions on how he can do that. Now here in Joshua chapter 1 and verse 7, it's very important what he's about to say. Remember, we're talking about focus is power. And God knows that, and God will give us that power as we decide to be focused on God. Now watch. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the instructions that Moses gave you. Do not, he's talking about being focused, do not deviate from them, turning either to the right or to the left. Remember, if I, if I clouded my eyes or put something around my eyes, I started to walk, and I didn't know where I was going. I could end up anywhere. He's saying, make sure that you keep focused on what God has said. Don't deviate to the right and don't go over to the left. Neither way. Uh, then you will be successful in everything you do. So focus is important. Being focused is vitally important. Being focused is vitally important. And because it's so important, the enemy will do everything he can to try to get your focus off of what God wants you to do. I know that. It's, it's happened to me, it's happened to you, it's happened to us, it's happened to all of us at some time or another. Uh, we're heading right to where we believe God wants us, and somebody will say something, or somebody will do something. If we're not careful, they'll actually get our focus off of what God wants us to do. Satan wants to steal your focus, because he knows that focus brings power into your life. You accomplish some great things if you'll keep focused. It doesn't mean the enemy won't try to take you and get you off what you're supposed to do. We know that because Peter, remember Peter? Peter, the, if you remember Peter, hello. Do you remember Peter? I <laughs> got worried there. I uh, thought maybe the mic wasn't working. I've been talking this whole time for no reason at all. Um, Peter, a great apostle of God, this great man of God, walked with God. He's in a boat. Jesus is walking by, and he says, hey, if that's you, let me walk on the water and come to you. And Jesus says, come. You remember the story? If you do, please say something out loud like Amen. And then we know that Satan, who's trying to get you and I off of focus, we're doing something God wants us to do. He'll start getting our mind somewhere. He does it to Peter. He gets his mind off. He's no longer single-minded looking at Jesus. Now he's starting to look at other things. And you know the story. He almost drowns, but we're still going to read it. Let's go over to Matthew chapter 14, verse 28. It says, And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And Jesus said, or he said, come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. This is the only other person in the history of the world that's ever walked on water. So we don't want to down Peter too much because he obviously walked on water. What we want to do is learn why he did not continue to walk on water. And the reason he did not continue to walk on water is the enemy stole his focus. He had power to walk on water until the enemy stole his focus. See, you can do some great things from God, but as soon as you start going the right direction, if the enemy can get your eyes off of what you're supposed to be doing, then all of a sudden you'll lose your power, and you'll wonder why you're starting to sink and lose 
All those good feelings you had. Now watch here. It says, and he said, come. And when Peter was come out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw, in other words, he all of a sudden took his focus off of Jesus. The wind boisterous, he was af afraid and beginning to seek, uh, sink, he cried, Lord, save me. Now, I want you to hear this. This is a, a Pastor Tim Rome's confession. Even just recently, I really felt the Lord lay something on my heart, the direction of this church. And I've been pursuing it and going that way. I've heard so many other voices sometimes say things. People that are close to me, I hear it. And, and if it, you're not careful, it take your focus off of what God, and you'll start, to, you'll start to lose power. You'll start to sink. Don't let it happen to you. I've allowed it to happen to me. I'm determined not to allow it to happen to me. I don't care who says what. I'm listening to God and, and you too. Let's keep focused. Amen? Right. Amen? Yeah. Uh, let me ask you this. What is Satan using? to take your focus off of what God wants you to do. It was waves. It was the wind for Peter. But what is it, or who is it, that Satan is using to steal your focus off of what God wants you to do? You know, Noah, we just talked about Peter not staying focused. Let's talk about someone who succeeded. Noah, in the Bible, God said, I want you to build an ark. Some believe it took him 120 years to build the ark, and he stayed focused. Uh, we believe that the people around him must have mocked him and made fun of him. Even his family probably questioned him because, you know, Dad, why are you every night you're going out and you're working all day, you're working on that thing. It, there's not even a lake around here. We, we don't even know what you're building. I mean, you can hear him. He's going, this is, we, it doesn't say that, but you can just about know that that's what's happening. But yet he stayed focused. Sometimes you're doing something and people will find all the reasons why you ought not be doing it. You know, they don't have any good ideas, but they, they're, they're good ideas. You ought not be doing it, and you're doing it wrong. So if you're doing something for God, don't let people talk you out of it. You're probably doing it right. Get some advice from godly people. You know, there's godly people around. Don't let them get you off of it. Noah stayed at it, and because of Noah, he saved all of mankind. He saved the animals. He saved the fowls of the air because he stayed focused. So when you say, is there power in being focused, ask Noah. There's power in being focused. Amen? There really, truly is. Uh, Nehemiah, the story that I really like a lot, the book of Nehemiah, I mean, my goodness, is a rich, beautiful book. If you ever have time to sit there and read the book of Nehemiah, it, it'll encourage you. It'll, it'll remind you of some things possibly that you've gone through or possibly some things you're going through. Nehemiah, I can just say this as an overview, he stayed focused. Let me tell you what had happened. The Jerusalem, the walls of Jerusalem, round about Jerusalem, and the gates had been knocked down. There were holes. There was big gaps in the, in the wall of Jerusalem. The people weren't there, and then God started bringing them back into Jerusalem. And when he brought them back into Jerusalem, they're not safe because the walls have these big gaps, this whole big long sections that are gone. The gates are down, and he's bringing his people back into Jerusalem, but it's a very dangerous place to be because the walls are all torn down. Now, Nehemiah doesn't even live there, and Nehemiah never built the walls. In fact, he wasn't even around when the walls were built. But yet God says to him, I want you to go back, and I want you to be focused about this. My mission to you is to rebuild that wall around Jerusalem. I want my people protected. So Nehemiah got the time off of work. He went over there and he went and he started building the wall of Jerusalem. Now, now hear this. When he's building the wall of Jerusalem, there are those that do not want him to build the wall of Jerusalem. So they do everything they can to discourage him. I'm going to read to you one of the areas where somebody tries to discourage him. Uh, one is called Sam Ballad. And, and listen to the place that he wants Nehemiah to stop building and come talk to him. I always think this is, the, you know, does God have humor? Maybe, because now what, let me read it to you. In Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 2. So Samballot and Gisham sent a message asking me, this is Nehemiah writing this himself, a message to me. Now, Nehemiah is building a wall. He's doing what God's asked him to do. He's focused on what God has asked him to do. So he's doing exactly what God wants him to do. But now watch. So the message asking me to meet them at one of the villages in the plain of Ono. Did you see that? In the plain of Ono. There we go. Oh, no. Now here. That means that there is what? Oh. And that right there means what? Oh, no. So. Oh, no, you're doing that. Come talk to me. Oh, no, what do you think you're doing? Come talk to me. Oh, no. I remember when my wife and I felt we should come to Chicago and work for God. 
um, when we told everyone around us, my friends and her family, they, uh, I think they were thinking, oh, no, are you crazy? Oh, no, they were supportive. They were nice. But I think probably in their mind, they're thinking, oh, no, what are you doing? And when you get ready to do something God's asked you to do, there are always going to be those around you that say, let's come to the valley of oh, no, and discuss why it cannot be done. And I like this story about Nehemiah. He's actually doing it. He's actually on the wall. He's supervising this work to be done. And the enemy comes along and says, hey, let's go over to the valley of oh no and let's discuss this. Now let's go on. uh, Put what else is there. It says, so I replied by uh, sending this message to them. I am engaged in a great work so I can't come. Why should I stop working to come and meet with you? Uh, This is what we need to say at times. People try to give us things and tell us things. What we need to say is, oh, no to oh, no. Oh, no to oh, no. Oh, no, pastor. Oh, no to oh, no. Oh, no to you. So you'll say, I'm supposed to do something for God. And they'll say, oh, no. Uh, Oh, no to them. We need to stay focused. If you agree with me and you agree with the word of God, say amen. Amen. If you don't agree with the word of God, say, oh, me, because you'd be in trouble. What or who is stopping you from accomplishing what God wants you to do? What or who is Satan Satan using to get you off focus? What or who is Satan using to steal your focus? Another great example is Jesus Christ himself. The the Bible tells us some some things about Jesus, and you can see Jesus setting his focus and not being off focus. Uh, One time he was, or you know, the time of temptation. We talk about the time of temptation when he was led into the wilderness. Satan kept trying to get him here and get him there, get him here, get him there. He was focused on doing the will of God, focused on the will of God, focused on the will of God. Uh, Jesus shows us the power of staying focused. In Luke chapter 9, verse uh, 51, Uh, Toward the end of his life, it says this. Now it came to pass when the time had come for him to be received up that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. In the Old Testament, when it talks about this particular time in Jesus' life, it said he set his face like flint. He he set his face and he just said, I'm going forward. He looked and he says, nothing is going to get me to turn to my left or turn to my right. My face is set like flint it's hard i'm going to do what my heavenly father wants me to do amen so don't let anybody steal your focus don't let satan use someone to steal your focus the enemy wants to steal your focus he's a thief because he knows that your focus is very powerful so he wants to steal your focus you'll never accomplish what god is asking you to do the people who will be blessed by you doing what you're supposed to do they'll never get blessed because he's taking your focus away from you he's got you wandering around you're going to end up somewhere but who knows where you're not going to end up where god wants you so it's important that we do not let the enemy steal our focus amen in hebrews chapter 12 verse 2 once again it talks about the focus of our lord and savior jesus god uh, jesus christ i believe it really is clear it says looking unto jesus the author and the finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross i see it this way jesus christ is going to the cross but he set his face he set his focus not on the cross but beyond the cross to you to me to what was needed to be done he set his focus on what his father wanted him to do so he knew the cross he knew what was going to happen on the cross but he set his focus beyond the cross he said he set his faith for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and has the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. The Bible tells you and I that we should. Uh, the Apostle Paul says this. He says, "Follow me as I follow Christ." So let's listen to him talk for a moment in Philippians. He says this, "Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things." which are behind. Now let's stop there. A lot of times when God tells you to do something, I found this out, you found this out, other people found it out when they've talked to me, they start doing something for God and the devil reminds them of a mistake they've made, a blunder they've made. He gets you off of focus and all of a sudden you're not accomplishing what God wants you to do because he's gotten you off of focus. Uh, Jesus, when he was in the, uh, the, the wilderness, Satan came to him 
and say, who do you, you're not the son of God. Tried to tell him something wasn't true. He was trying to get him off of focus. You and I, who do you think you are? Do you really think you're forgiven? The answer is yes. He said, who do you think you are trying to do something for God? Uh, you know, how about your past? Do you honestly think you're forgiven? Yes, I do. Uh, you just made a mistake yesterday. Do you really think God still wants to use you? Yes, I do. Well, you just thought something you shouldn't thought or you shouldn't be thinking. What do you think about that? I think God's going to use me. I think I'm focused. I think I'm going on for God. Amen? Amen. I am not disqualified. You're not disqualified. We're going on for God, aren't we? Amen. Amen. So I, I think we need to stay focused. Uh, he says, I count not myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. Uh, if you made mistakes, let them go. For, uh, reaching forward to those things which are ahead. It's like set your face like flint. I press toward the goal. The goal, you're focusing on the goal and for the prize of, uh, of the upward call of God in Jesus or Christ Jesus. Uh, so we don't want Satan to steal our focus. I'm going to end with this today. This is the last point. You don't want Satan. Don't let Satan. Don't let the thief rob you of your faith. I've talked to people who've been hurt. Let me just say this first. Faith pleases God. Faith can remove mountains out of the way. Faith can bring rewards into your life, and that's why in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6 it says, but without faith it's impossible to please him. For him that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder. God rewards you. Faith reward, rewards of the, them that diligently seek you. So, so know this. Satan wants to steal your faith because he doesn't want you to make it. He doesn't want you to have that reward. He's trying to steal your faith. Now, the way he uses, or the things he uses is this, delays. Sometimes Satan can steal people's faith because there's a little delay, a delay on what they thought would happen. It's taking longer than what they thought. This is what happened to the children of Israel. They were walking in the wilderness. They started to get delayed and getting to where they thought they should get as fast as they thought and so they lost faith so satan will use delays in our life to try to get us to let our faith go he wants to rob you of your faith by using delays in your life now the bible says in galatians chapter 6 and verse 9 and let us not be weary in well doing for in due season we'll reap if we faint not now don't let it get to you if there's a delay, just keep on believing God. If there's a delay, know this. Uh, many people, many men and women of God have tasted that delay and, and said, well, God, you're there, aren't you? And God says, yes, don't give up on me. Yes, don't give up on me. Somebody who was uh, like a spiritual daddy to me at times in my life was Ed Dufresne. Ed Dufresne talked about the time where he was, uh, he, he, had, he was down to the last day and he had to have come up with so much money or they were going to lose their facility. And he, said, he was in his office praying and it was like getting down to the last couple of minutes and somebody came into the church and gave him a check. Somebody he didn't even know gave him a check for the exact amount they needed. Uh, don't give up on God. There might be delays, but don't give up on God. Yeah, Satan will try to steal by delays, but he also will try to steal by disappointments. Uh, listen to me, church. We've all had disappointments. We've all thought things would work one way or we, we thought somebody would live who didn't live. We thought something would happen that didn't happen. We don't know everything, and I'm not going to blame God for any of it. Disappointments, Satan will use disappointments to take away your faith. He'll use disappointments to rob you. And once he finds out that disappointments start to steal your faith, you'll face other disappointments. He'll use them. We have to shove that away and push that away. I say, I'm going to continue to believe God. I have to continue to believe God. I'm going to continue to believe God because I don't know everything, but I know my God. And I know I'm disappointed. I know I'm sad about this. I don't understand it all. But I'm not going to let it steal my faith because I don't know all the facts. One thing I do know that God is God. Amen? So one of the ways Satan will, will use to, to take away your faith is a delay. Another one is, is disappointments. Now, just like disappointments can steal your faith, let me say this to you. Determination can bring strength to your faith. When you decide to be determined, I'm determined no matter what happens, I'm going to keep on going on for God. Your faith will strengthen. F Satan wants to discourage you. David, you've heard me say this before, but David learned a secret. He's facing Goliath. 
he looks up at this nine foot four inch giant and he starts remembering and reminding himself I took on the lion I took on the bear I'm going to take him on he reminds himself he encourages himself there's times that discouragement will come in there's times that things will try to come on you that you'll feel oh who am I to try to do this he'll try to discourage you like why would you even try give up give up just give up give up we learn from David facing the giant what you do is you remember the, the victories you had you don't remember where you stumbled you remember where you made it you start reminding yourself I made it I won this thing I won that I because of God I won that because of God and later on in his life his family had been taken from him he came home and I've told you this before and he's on the ground crying and wailing with everybody else his strength was gone see focus focus brings power faith brings power and so both those things Satan wants to take so David is laying on the ground and all of a sudden he learns something I need to encourage myself because he's trying to discourage me so when he tries to discourage me if I decide to encourage me he's going to stop because he doesn't want me to keep going so every time he tries to discourage us we need to start talking about how good God is amen we just need to stand there remember Satan has tried to steal your faith Satan wants to steal your faith by delays discouragement uh, disappointments and he'll keep using it just stand strong the Apostle Paul said fight the good fight of faith because he knew you and I would run into times where our faith would be tested and then he said over in 2nd uh, Timothy chapter 4 and verse 7 uh, he says this I fought a good fight I finished my course so he's saying there is a fight of faith the thief is trying to steal your faith he said I know you're going to be disappointed he goes I've been disappointed I know you're going to be delayed I was delayed I know there'll be discouragements I have been discouraged but fight the good fight of faith because there's a lot of good things going on and we're not going to let the devil steal it amen just say this I'm not going to let I'm not going to let the devil steal my faith I'm holding on to my faith and my faith is getting stronger. I'm going to lead you in some confessions. And the reason we have confessions is because uh, they build our strength inside of us. Why don't you say this? I'm not going to let the thief rob me of unity. Because unity brings strength. I'm not going to allow the thief to steal my joy. Because joy brings strength. I'm not going to allow the enemy to steal my generosity because generosity brings strength. I'm not going to allow the enemy to steal my zeal because that brings strength. And I'm not going to allow the enemy to steal my faith because faith has strength. I resist you, Satan. I humble myself to God. I receive unity from God. Joy from God. I receive the gift of generosity. God gives me zeal. Gives me focus. Gives me faith. And I'm not backing down. In Jesus' name, amen. Give God a hand clap. Nathan's going to come up and play. He's going to play Just As I Am. Just As I Am. That'll be a, a real good song to play. Uh, don't let the enemy steal. Now, 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 please know this. Good news, we're moving forward. Good news, uh, when you're going to move forward, when God has us do stuff, there's always going to be an enemy. And maybe we've caught ourselves saying things we ought not say. doesn't mean you're the devil. doesn't mean you're terrible. It just means you got caught up in something. I forgive you, he forgives you, we forgive you. He certainly has forgiven me. I've done the same thing. And, and so if you say, oh, he said that, and I think, did he hear I was saying that? Well, if it was you or the person next to you, just turn around. Let's get focused and go on for God. I love you, amen? And God loves us because I have said some things I shouldn't say. And thank God he forgave me. Well, God bless you.
this is a song. When I was about eight years old, I walked down to the church of Christ and gave my heart to the Lord as an eight-year-old guy. This song here, Just As I Am Without One Plea. Go ahead. Father, in the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, we thank you that we can come to you like we are, but you don't leave us that way. We thank you, Father God, that your love is so powerful and so real. We thank you that you've warned us that there is an enemy, and then you've told us how to stand, resist him in the power that you've placed within us by the Holy Spirit. We thank you, Father God, that he must flee from us in terror when we resist him. We thank you, Father God, that we can resist and not being in unity. We can resist, Heavenly Father, not having joy. We can resist, Heavenly Father, not, not being on fire for you. We can resist, Heavenly Father, all the things that we've talked about in the last three weeks. And we, Father, resist today. We're going to stay focused. We're going to stay in faith. We're going to stay with zeal. We're going to be generous. We're going to have joy. We're going to stay in unity, and we're going to go on and do some great things for God because you're a great God, and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, God bless you. Give God a hand clap. God bless you. Thank you.